When I was in Israel, uh, we visited a spot that uh, struck me um, pretty heavily, and I, I, um, it, w- it wasn't like one of those, those uh, entertaining moments on the trip. It was, a, it was sort of a solemn moment, and, and not to be a drag, um, I, I feel like I just need to share it this morning, and, and um, it, <laughs> it's probably not my best sermon. Um, You, I, I, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't. I mean, you can. My wife did. Um, but, but the power is never in the preacher. The power is in the word. And if the word doesn't speak to us through the power of the Holy Spirit, then. It doesn't really matter how good the sermon is or how good the preacher is. The question is this morning, would we open our hearts to what the Spirit has to say? Um, I'm, I'm going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, there are free Bibles in the rack underneath you, behind you, in front of you, beside you, I don't know. Or just use the Bible you brought or the Bible the person next to you brought. And... Um, First Samuel, if you hold up your Bible, is about fifth of way, a fifth of the way in. So if you're good with uh, math, you can figure that one out. Uh, if you're new to the Bible, welcome to it. Uh, this, this is a powerful book. We, we, li- we live our lives based on the truth that God re- has revealed in the Word of, of God. Um, it, it changes the way we think. It changes the way we act. It changes the way we live. Uh, if we're content to be living a certain way and then we come to the Word, we find out that sometimes the Word confronts us. Uh, guess who wins, me or the Word? It's the Word. It's got to be the Word. And the Word through the power of the Spirit. So I just, I just hope and pray that me, I myself, will be willing to let the Spirit speak to me this morning. This story is told here in 1 Samuel chapter 3. It's picking up after young Samuel, who was given by his mother to... Because Samuel was a gift from God, so she promised God that she would give him in service to the Lord. So she brought him as a young boy to Eli, the high priest, and and said, you are to raise him. And and God began to speak to Samuel, and Samuel was didn't know, he had never heard the voice of God before, because the way chapter 3 begins is is the, the, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And if you look at what was really going on in those days, it begs the question, Was the word of the Lord rare in those days because listening was rare? Because the Bible also says if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be added unto you. Which means if we truly seek after God, we will find him. If a person says, I've been looking for God and I can't find him. My first question is, let's talk about your search techniques. Because the Bible says, if you look for him with all your heart, you will find him. So if the word of the Lord was rare in those days, my question is, was listening rare? My hunch is, yes. So Samuel hears the word of the Lord, and through a series of events, Eli finally figures it out. It's God speaking. He says, go back. And so when God says, uh, says your name again, say, here I am, your servant is listening. And so Samuel heard from the Lord, and the message wasn't great. It was, a, it was a message about Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who were scoundrels at best. They were the pastors of the church at Shiloh. I'm picking it up now in verse 15, chapter 3. Samuel stayed in bed until morning. Then he got up and opened the doors of the tabernacle as usual. He was afraid to tell Eli, the high priest, what the Lord had said to him. But Eli called out to him, Samuel, my son. Here I am, Samuel replied. What did the Lord say to you last night? Tell me everything, and may God strike you and even kill you if you hide anything from me. (laughs) No pressure there. (laughs) So Samuel told Eli everything. He didn't hold back anything. It is the Lord's will, Eli replied. Let him do what he thinks best. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. I like the one way one version says it, and his words did not fall to the ground. Hmm. And all Israel from Dan, that's like way up in the northern Galilee, way, way, way up near near, uh, the border of Syria and Lebanon, from Dan, cleared down into Beersheba. Everyone 
um, knew that Samuel uh, was from, spoke on behalf of God as a prophet. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh. Underline that word, Shiloh. Shiloh, and gave a message to Samuel there at the tabernacle. And Samuel's words went out to all the people of Israel. Now, Shiloh, by the way, and just this, is a, this is the place where, where Moses told Joshua when they crossed into the promised land to build the tabernacle at Shiloh. And he gave him the instructions on how to do it. So, so the moment that the Israelites crossed in, and remember they, they marched around Jericho and they began to take the country, they moved into Shiloh, this, this area, and they built the tabernacle. It was a, a temporary tabernacle, temporary for 300 and something years, but it was temporary. So at the time Israel, at this time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. The Israelite army was camped near Ebenezer, and the Philistines were at Ephek. The Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. After the battle was over, the troops repeated, or retreated to their camp, and the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Have you ever asked that question before? Lord, I am embarrassed. You embarrassed me. Why didn't you show up? Hmm. Then they said, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. If we carry it, it into battle, it into battle, it, the Lord? No, it, the box, God in the box. There's a big, bolt, big old box with these cherubim on top, the mercy seat. And, and in there was Aaron's rod and the, and the two uh, uh, t- uh, tablets of Moses, the Ten Commandments, and a jar of manna. It, it was the presence of God. It was held in the temple. The holy of holies. Let's carry the God in a box with us. If we carry it into battle with us, it will save us. It will save us from our enemies. So they sent men to Shiloh to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord of heaven's armies who was enthroned between the cherubim. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, scoundrels, that's my addition there, were also there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When all the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord coming into the camp, their shout of joy was so loud it made the ground shake. What's going on, the Philistines asked. What's all the shouting about in the Hebrew camp? When they were told it was because the Ark of the Lord had arrived, they panicked. The gods have come into their camp, they cried. This is a disaster. We've never had to face anything like this before. Help! Who can save us from these mighty gods of Israel? They're the same gods who destroyed the Egyptians with plagues when Israel was in the wilderness. uh, Fight as never before, Philistines. If you don't, we will become the Hebrews' slaves just as they have been ours. Stand up and fight like men. So the Philistines fought desperately, and Israel was defeated. The slaughter was great, 30,000 Israelite soldiers died that day. The survivors turned and fled to their tents. The ark of God was captured, and Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were killed. Oops. Why didn't God in a box work? He's been powerful before. He's been in the Holy of Holies. We know that when people have touched it, they've died. Hmm. Well, here's the deal. The Philistines took that ark, but they didn't hold on to it long because the power that didn't show up for the Israelites definitely showed up for the Philistines because wherever they took the ark, they broke out in cancer. So they moved it to the next town. Guess what happened there? They broke out in cancer. They kept moving around. Everybody had cancer. They're like, get rid of this thing. So they hooked it up to a couple of cows and sent it back. That's the shortened version, but that's exactly what happened. Get that thing out of here. What didn't bring good luck to the Israelites was bad luck to the Philistines. If it weren't for God, where would you be this morning? If it weren't for the power of God at work in your life, through your life, in the lives of those around you, where would you be this morning? If my life can be described in a pretty much the same way that you see it now without God, then do I really have 
the power of God living in me. If my life, on the other hand, cannot be described without telling the story of God, that's where the Lord wants me. Here, 300 years goes by after the Israelites move into Israel. They've put the tabernacle at Shiloh. The Ark of the Covenant is in there. But over 300 years, they've drifted from their faith. They've salt and peppered their Jewish faith with, oh, Asherah, the god of fertility. I don't even want to describe what took place in the worship of Asherah. The, the god literally was a large phallic symbol. They, 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 they worshiped Baal, the rain god. But they also came to some of the Jewish festivals, most of them, the ones that were convenient, and they did the right thing because, after all, they were the chosen people. I mean, they were secure. I mean, God's not going to get rid of them, so why not? Let's just salt and pepper uh, our, our, our faith with the things that work, that are culturally popular. And by the way, if we get in trouble, we'll just go get the God in a box and take him with us. I have a dashboard Jesus, and I still get tickets. <laughs> I'm taking it back. It doesn't work. <laughs> Whatever. Is my chosenness an ironclad assurance that no matter how I live, God's still going to come through because, well, I'm his. I, I, I'm, I'm covered. I can do whatever I want. Because, you know, I, I got baptized. I prayed the sinner's prayer. And I did everything the church told me to do with that formula. So I'm good, right? So I don't really have to think about Jesus. I don't really have to live with him or for him or uh, that kind of messes my life up in fact but but i'm religious i'm secure right does god look past my indiscretion and rescue me because i've simply performed the rites will a lucky god charm protect me from the consequences of my choices last sunday um in the first service uh, Bill Randolph went down on the floor and his heart stopped. And uh, we prayed and there were some great people who knew what they were doing. I, it's amazing. I've heard those some statistics this week and how many really, really skilled people who have performed uh, CPR that it's not successful. It's amazing how, how few actually are saved and yet God brought Bill back to life. However, it all praise and glory goes to God. But I said to Bill when I went to visit him after the service, I said, Bill, um, what in the world were you doing messing up this first service this morning? <laughs> and he laughed. I said, you know, Bill, I said, if this was luck, this would be a good day to buy a lottery ticket. And he says, it's not luck. I said, no, God's not done with you. We don't believe in luck. We don't believe in good luck charms. We don't believe in, you know, angel in my pocket, Jesus on my dashboard. Even, even motorcyclists, I'm, you guys are going to get mad at me now. They have little gremlin bells on their motorcycles. Really? <laughs> if I fall down, it's probably because I'm stupid, not because there's a gremlin, okay? <sighs> there, I just... These people went and got their God in the box. They didn't want to live for him. They just wanted God to come through for him. So Shiloh, it's a beautiful place. Actually, it's, it's an amazing place. Yes. Um, it's, um, if you go to Jerusalem and you look, well, if you look on a map, and you might have a map in the back of your Bible. I don't think the free Bibles have maps, but, but you might have a map in, in, in your Bible, and you'll see that Shiloh is actually north of Jerusalem on the way to like Jezreel and the, and the Jezreel Valley. When you get to Jerusalem, the mountains begin to run sort of north and south, 
which means you don't really want to go east and west, because if you do, you're going to go up really steep mountains, down really steep canyons, and back up the mountain, and by the time you get to the city you're trying to attack, you'll be tired, and you'll probably lose. So geography was very, very important in warfare in those days. If, you're, if the mountains run north and south, you travel north and south on the ridge routes. There's less up and down. Now, when you get to the Jezreel Valley, it is the place for, to go north or east and west. It's a great place to, uh, to actually travel through. But on the route, on the route to uh, Jezreel is, is Shiloh. Shiloh is on the ridge route. Now, um, you'll see here there are um, actual formations that suggest to us that we have uh, foundations of buildings and such. We don't know exactly where that tabernacle might have been, but there's a pretty strong chance that up in this area, the tabernacle of the Lord would have been. It's, it, it's, it measures out to be about the right size. We don't know. We haven't found archaeological evidence saying this is the place, but this would be a good place if you're going to set up a tabernacle in Shiloh. It's actually a beautiful spot, but if you were to t stand right where I am and turn around, and this is exactly what I did, and took a picture, you would see this road. Do you see that road there coming down through here? The modern roads follow the ancient roads. What worked then still works. So underneath several road beds, you would find that original road that the Israelites would have traveled back and forth. Remember, north and south travel in this area until you get up into this area, which is Jezreel, where you can go east and west. And this is the Mediterranean over here. So this spot, Shiloh, can easily be seen by the ridge route coming out of Jerusalem. That's really important to remember. Not very far from Jerusalem, anytime you're traveling north and south, you will see Shiloh. You turn to the east, looking towards Jericho, and uh, you can see that it's built on a high plain where many could see it from miles away. It's in the Ephraim Hill Country. It was the religious capital of Jerusalem or Israel for 300 years. It was there the tabernacle built, was built and it, it housed the Ark of the Covenant. Actually, the Talmud says that 369 years it, 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 it was there. So we don't know exactly, but it was a long time. And that's when the Israelites took the ark into battle and it was captured by the Philistines. What, was, what were they thinking? We don't really aren't really devoted to God. We're not really sold out to God, but God chose us and we're his chosen people so we're safe. So let's take him into battle so we'll win. He'll be like uh, Jesus on our dashboard. And the Philistines took him. And in 1 Samuel 4, it says that Philistine came, the Philistines came back and destroyed Shiloh. What's really interesting is the, is the, the stones that you see just piled on top of each other. This is what Shiloh's looked like now since that time. They didn't build any more cities there. So every time you're going north and south out of Jerusalem, you look over there and you see this pile of stones and you remember the story of Shiloh. The geography tells stories. That's why the Bible says, when you walk along the way, teach your children. Because everywhere they went, when, this is where this happened, son. Let me tell you about what happened here. I wonder how many times we do that in our own lives and we drive past places that, that were meaningful to us. Do we ever stop and say, well, let me tell you the story that happened here. The stories that glorify God. I have, I have a place like that here in Nampa, the big water tower. That was my grandma's and grandpa's horse ranch. Back in the 60s when it was... When it was uh, uh, a drought, Grandma uh, prayer walked before they knew what to call that. She just walked around the land and prayed. And she said, Lord, we need water. And she felt an impression from the Lord. I don't know exactly what happened if the Lord's, I don't know. And the Lord said, this is the place to dig. So they dig. Guess what they found? An artesian well. They had to put in a water tower. So every time I drive by that water tower, I want to say, hey, let me just tell you about this uh, water tower. See, geography speaks 
And so every time they walked past Shiloh, it spoke. They saw the destruction. And it reminded them of this story. So what do we learn from this? Misused power is still power. But it becomes destructive, not constructive. The power of God is real. We can't mess with it. But if we're misusing it, it will destroy us, not build us up. For Israel, it brought about shame. For the Philistines, it brought about pain. But it became a story. Turn with me back to, to, to Jeremiah. Go, go right. About halfway through the Bible, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, Jeremiah chapter 7. Now, Jeremiah is speaking to the Israelites in Judah. Judah is the southern kingdom below Jerusalem. Now, if you go down into that area, you'll find that the hills are high, the valleys are very narrow and, and, and deep. It's rough country. Whenever anybody would try and attack Jerusalem, they would try to come from the north, the ridge route. Because if you came from the south or you came from the east or west, your, your troops are going to be worn out. So they come from the, the north because it was almost like a ramp coming into, Israel, into Jerusalem. So Judah, because of that, they weren't very exposed to the world. This is, a, this is a sermon in and of itself. They were actually fairly protected. And so it, it's... If you look, as you, as you go to Shiloh and beyond that, the, the mountains get lower, the valleys get wider, and it gets easier for international travel to happen. And whenever there's international travel, there's culture intermixing with their culture. And so you'll find throughout history that the northern kingdom often fell into apostasy faster than the southern kingdom because they were more secluded, harder to get to. The more exposed we are to the world, the more we live in the world, in, in its culture, in its, its influences, the more easily we fall. That's why, that's why the Bible says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's a side note, but now Jeremiah is speaking to Judah, the southern kingdom, who has fallen into apostasy. Chapter 7, verse 1 of Jeremiah, the Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go to the entrance of the Lord's temple and give this message to the people. O oh, Judah, listen to this message from the Lord. Listen to it, all of you who worship here. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Even now, if you quit your evil ways... I will let you stay in your own land. But, but don't be fooled by those who promise you safety simply because the Lord's temple is here. Do you hear that again? Safety because the Lord's temple is here. The temple's here. Don't worry about it. You, 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 we got God in the box here. No worries. You're safe. You're secure. You're the chosen people. They chant. The Lord's temple is here. The Lord's temple is here. The KJV, the King James Version, I think it has it three times. It, this could actually have been an incantation, a chant that they used. Like magic potion. Don't worry, you're chosen. You're saved by grace. You can live like, uh, yeah. Careful, careful. But I will be merciful only if you stop your evil thoughts and deeds and start treating each other with justice. Only if you stop exploiting foreigners, orphans, and widows. Only if you stop murdering and, and only if you stop harming yourselves by worshiping idols. Then I'll let you stay in this land that I gave your ancestors to keep forever. Don't be fooled into thinking that you'll never suffer because the temple is here. It's a lie. Do you really think you can steal, murder, commit adultery, lie, and burn incense to Baal and all those other new gods of yours and then come here and stand before me in my temple and chant, we're safe, we're safe, only to go back out and do those evils again? Don't you yourselves admit that this temple which bears my name has become a den of thieves? Surely I see all the evil going on here, and I, the Lord, have spoken. Look at the next verse. Go now to the place at Shiloh, where I once put the tabernacle that bore my name. See what I did there because of all the wickedness of my people, the Israelites? 
While you're doing these wicked things, says the Lord, I spoke to you about it repeatedly, but you didn't listen. I called out to you, but you refused to answer. So just as I destroyed Shiloh, I will now destroy this temple that bears my name, this temple that you trust in for help, this place that I gave to you and your ancestors. I will send you out of my sight into exile just as I did your relatives, the people of Israel. And did he do it? Yes, he did. Because what God is saying to us is, I didn't call you into a business arrangement. I didn't call you into some sort of a, 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 a formula, a potion to live life. I called you into a relationship. I want to interact with you on a daily basis. I want to be in your life. I want to bless your life. So I want your life to be a blessing to others. I didn't call you to treat me like God in a box. I'm not your good luck charm. I don't care how many times you say the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Who cares? I'll respond to you as you respond to me, heart to heart. Wow. It's when we start mixing our faith with pop theology. I'm just going to add salt and pepper my Christianity with a little bit of bail, a little bit of pop culture religion, the hottest, the latest, whatever the big buzz is. Who gives a hang about all that stuff? Jesus says, I want you. Hook, line, and sinker. I want you all for myself. I'm a jealous God. There are people within Christianity today who are saying, Jesus is not the only way to God. What do you do with the words when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life? No man comes to the Father but by me. But, but we can't, he probably didn't say that. Is that all you got? In fact, he did say that. And I got to figure out what that means. Because he meant it. I've, I've walked among other countries and other religions. And trust me, I, I've been in the, the country where there, there's the largest concentration of Buddhism in the world. When they hear the good, pure, clean gospel, they're excited. It's good news. Because this is the only faith where God became man. We couldn't reach him, so he reached us. Every other religion is about reaching God with our own efforts. How exhausting. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that God became man and dwelt among us. He suffered in all points as we have, yet he was without sin. He took upon himself our iniquity. He bore our sins that we might live. And Jesus calls us into that kind of a relationship, not religion. He doesn't want religion. He doesn't want church to become something that we do because, well, that's what you do if you're a Christian. He wants it to be meaningful. Jack Beck, Dr. Jack Beck, calls this um, kind of thinking sympathetic magic. That's a powerful term. Reducing God and my faith to sympathetic magic. If I just do everything right, if I pray the right prayer and I, I walk through and go through all the right hoops, then, then I'm in and I'm, I'm good and I can do whatever I want. No. No. God calls us into relationship with him. That's daily. It's messy, but it's real. And it's filled and led by the Holy Spirit of God. I'm not good enough to walk this walk, you guys, and neither are you. I don't have the strength to do what God's called me to do, but I do through the power of the Holy Spirit as I submit my life to him on a daily, moment-by-moment -moment basis. And I need my brothers and sisters in the Lord to encourage me, to pray for me that I stay on that path. You see, the word repentance doesn't just mean to make a U-turn. It means literally to get off the path you're walking and get back onto the path of God. It is to admit, this is God's path over here. I've been walking this path. This is the path I want. But to repent is to say, oops, this is a bad path. Wrong path. Lord, I want to get back on your path. 
And that's what the Holy Spirit does by, by bringing conviction of the Spirit. The preacher's never good enough to bring conviction. If conviction is real, it is from the Holy Spirit. And trust me on this one, let me just tell you from experience, if, it, if it's conviction of the Spirit, don't argue with it, because it won't leave. He loves us way too much to leave us alone. Shiloh became an icon of the foolishness of sympathetic magic. They, they had reduced God and his power to a box that they took to war for good luck. Jesus came that we might have real life. I remember when Peter was standing on the steps, the southern temple, if you saw that video I, I did from the southern steps a few weeks ago, those people came that day not knowing exactly what was going to happen. And the Spirit of God moved among them. And, and as Peter stood and he preached and he told them the truth, it says in Acts 2.37, their hearts were cut. And they said, what must we do to be saved? And Peter said, repent and be baptized. Follow after him. Live, live your life for him. And when I think about a story like this, when I think about Shiloh, when I think about Jeremiah, when I think about how easily it is for me to reduce God to this thing that I put on a shelf and I go to when I need him, but when I don't need him, I do my own thing. God does not want that for me or for you. He wants to be in my life on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. This week we were praying as a staff and praying for you guys, praying for us that that the Lord would have his way, and we felt an, uh, a very impressed, and we, we, we said it out loud to one another, and we, we said, let's just test, the, the word says test the spirits. So I said, you guys, you need to test this, because I don't know, but my, my inkling says, my hunch says that this is what we're supposed to do, and as we tested that in prayer, we agreed together that this is what the Lord was saying. He said, I want you to fill the baptism waters this, this week. All right, Lord. But, but what happens if nobody shows up, Jesus? Then the words of somebody else, somebody asked me here recently, say, are you afraid to look like a fool for Jesus? You're going to be somebody's fool. <laughs> hey, you're right. I'd rather be a fool for Jesus than anybody else. So we did. We filled the, the baptismal. We, did, we just did it because we felt like that's what the Lord said. And I've frankly been a little weirded out by it, not knowing exactly how to do it all. And so we decided to visit a church last night, and the staff went over to, uh, to Eagle Christian Church last night for the Saturday night service. And uh, we called Steve, the pastor, over there and said we're coming. And you know what's weird this week is that, that the Lord, in a, in a little bit of a different way, told him to th do the same thing. So they filled up the baptism. <laughs> so this morning... They're, they're doing the same thing. And I thought, well, if God told us to do that and God told them to do it, I wonder what other churches in the valley are doing that this morning. I wonder what God's up to. And you see, baptism is not a, a magic incantation. Baptism is simply an outward sign of an inward work of grace. When I say God has changed my life or I want to change my life, I want to give my life to him, the, baptism has always been, been a, a, a representation of going down in death to our old selves and coming up in new life in Christ. It is to say, I am tired of living this life without Christ. I'm tired of living that way. I'm tired of living just going to God on the shelf when I need him and then doing my own thing. It's miserable. I want my life to be lived for Christ and I want him to live through me. I'm sorry, getting a little emotional. I don't want to be emotional. This is not me. I can't do this. But I said the same thing in the first service. I said, okay, we were there last night and, and Steve is much more organized than I am, and he actually thought about this, and he went, he went out and bought a bunch of um, gym shorts and, and black t-shirts. I went, that's brilliant. <laughs> so I went to Walmart last night. I got the weirdest looks as I bought 20 black t-shirts in various sizes and 20 black gym shorts. She looked at me and went, don't ask. <laughs> All right. 
You may have come this morning and you're thinking, you're crazy. Well, you're, you're right. Uh, but you may be saying, you're, you're nuts. I, I didn't come ready to be baptized, but, but you're saying your heart's beating out of your chest and you know that this message is for you this morning. You're saying, I'm, I'm ready to stand up. Six people did it in the first service this morning. Praise the Lord for that. And we're not going to wait long. I'm going to pray right now, and I'm going to ask uh, Howard if you could go over there. If this is the day that you say, you know what, you're right, preacher, uh, the Spirit is on me, and, and I know that I need to give my life to Christ, and, and I need to be baptized today, to, right now. I, I'm ready to go, folks. I'm, I'm good to go. I'll get wet. I don't care. And we have things back there that you can change into. If you don't want to change, we've got plastic sacks you can put on your seat so you don't get your car seat wet. We're good to go. But if the Spirit, not the preacher, if the Spirit is saying to you, today's the day, I've put my finger on your life and I want you. I've been following you. Today's the day. Respond. If we have no one, we'll go home early. If we have several, you can leave whenever you need to, but we'll just keep on dunking until the Lord says, stop. Jesus, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the warning of Scripture that we are not to reduce you to a box, some kind of a power that we go to when we need help but otherwise leave you alone and leave you out of our lives. Forgive us for that, Jesus, we pray. Lord, there are some perhaps here this morning that, that are hearing this message for the very first time and they know that they're here for a reason because this, their, heart, their, their heart is telling them, this is, this is for me this morning. Lord, give them the courage to, to respond. A sister gave this to me this morning as she's worshipped here and, and she felt the Lord was saying this and I'm going to read this to you because I, I think this is for us. She said, God is saying there are some people here today who are coming to church, but during the week your life is burdened with secret sin. God is calling you to come out. He loves you, and he longs for you. Come. We're going to stand, we're going to sing, and if this is your day, I'm going to ask you to just come down here and stand with Pastor Howard, and then he'll tell you what to do next. If nobody comes, we'll leave early. Let's stand. Now let's sing this song, and if if you want to respond to this right now and you want to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you want to live your life for Christ, come. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. Amen. Well, if you're going to need to leave early today, you feel free because it looks like we're going to be here a while. Amen. And I guess that's why God said fill up the baptismal. So I'm going to go back there. You guys just lead 